I'm Matthew Bright, and I am the director and writer of Freeway and Freeway 2. I was born in Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Missouri. It's an army base, and uh, stayed there for the first year of life. Moved to New York, and then uh, I guess eight or nine, I guess, uh, moved to Chicago. Uh, Chicago was the beginning of my actual formative years, having nothing to do with parents, you know, uh, film, that sort of thing. Uh, the pinnacle of cinema for me at the time was Warner Brothers cartoons. Uh, I think, uh, I still think it's great. Um, they're great. Brilliant writing, brilliant execution. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's had a life, lifelong effect, you know, with other things, but, you know, that's definitely in there. And it is art. And, uh, I was attracted to noir-like films, uh, you know, uh, stuff you see at three in the morning, kids get up early, you know, and uh, I liked all those uh, crime stuff and, and uh, gangsters and uh, Al Capone and M Squad with Lee Marvin and um, Highway Patrol and God. Uh, yeah, it was great stuff. Well, the first film I ever had anything to do with was uh, uh, The Forbidden Zone. And it was basically just a, a project of, it was like a club. And we'd get together on weekends or maybe a, every other weekend and shoot it for like three, four years. And it was with uh, this group I was with, Oingo Boingo, and um, you know, all my friends. All my friends were in it. Um, gosh. Uh, and it, it, it took a while to make it. Um, and then uh, Rick Elfman, who, who ran Oingo Boingo at the time, before his brother took it over, edited the film, and, and uh, it was great. It was fun. And um, I sort of got the bug for, for doing I always knew I wanted to make films. And some, that's, uh, that was definitely an amateur film, but we did have some professional people in it. We had Susan Terrell and mm -hmm. Joe Spinell and Viva, and uh, you know, it was a crazy film, God. Uh, Hervé, yeah, yeah, he, he was uh, roommates with Susan Terrell at the time. And I guess he got on Fantasy Island while we were doing it. So we had to suddenly get professional and, and wrap it up quick, because he was going to disappear. I, I was writing, I liked writing, and I really was not really employable for much else. So I did that, and uh, I had no expectations of being allowed to direct. I just wasn't, uh, and I didn't have confidence. I, I wasn't a social kind of, uh, just, I was socially inept. I might still be socially inept, you know. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of ambition. I had a really pretty girlfriend. I had a motorcycle and a dog I loved, and uh, that was it. You know, it was, I felt like I was rich. And uh, I wrote some, you know, low-budget horror movies and, and stuff. To, uh, you know, not, I did some spec scripts, but, you know, most of these were hires and, you know, a little bit of money. I mean, like $5,000 total for, you know, for everything including residuals and then um, uh, I knew this guy who was working for Oliver Stone and he said uh, I'll give it to Oliver you know maybe maybe he wants to direct that's it's a film I wrote called Freeway and um, a script and uh, he gave it to Oliver and Oliver three days later I mean I guess he picked it up and read it and had fun and, and uh, we uh, went out Actually, no, there was some professional interest beforehand, and we went out trying to get actors, but we couldn't get any actor to do it. We couldn't get anybody to work with me. Um, you know, I was unknown completely, and what I... Crazy, though. That's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, I'd written Gun Crazy, so I had some, you know, I had some cachet, but, um, you know, that was as a writer, and... and uh, Anyways, Oliver read and said, clearly you should be directing this. I'll let you, you know, try to find some actors and actresses. And uh, God, I remember we had John Travolta, but the 
producers that were signed on before Oliver got involved said no, you know, we don't want him. And he went on and did uh, um, that that Tarantino flick, you know, um, yeah, Pulp Fiction. And everybody said I was copying Pulp Fiction with Freeway, which there's nothing alike. You know, but um, and also, you know, I did Freeway before Pulp Fiction. Anyways, so we couldn't have Tra John Travolta, and uh, fortunately, um, um, you know, we we got our actor and. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland, and that was the, the go-ahead for it. We got the go, the green light, with me. And uh, um, if we hadn't gotten him, Oliver would have directed it. It might have been a better film, I don't know. I didn't know anything about her. And somebody said, you know, you should look at her, and she comes in and, you know, she was pretty good, and she looked almost exactly like my ex-wife, you know? It, it, so um, there was that connection. But then we worked with her, and I worked with her the first day, and I swear to God, it, it was like um, uh, Reese is the first person I directed, and it was like the feeling I had walking in off the street, not knowing who Jimi Hendrix was, and Jimi Hendrix was playing. So I sat down in the front row, and within like ten seconds, you know, of doing a riff before the, the bass player and the drummer came in, I knew I was like in the presence of something really special. And I got that same feeling with Reese. It was like I was, it was my first case of being professionally in love. You know, just as an art, looking at this artist, I was just floored. And I still am, she's just, Jesus Christ. Um, it was electric, I mean, it was just shocking. And, and she was so good and, um, that's when I sort of fell in love with making movies. You know, when you sit down and write a script, you have to be interested. And, you know, in your characters and all that. And I just, at the time, I'm different now, but at the time, I really couldn't sustain interest in anything a guy did. I looked at guys as being basically like dogs, you know, dogs. They're just dogs. And I still feel that way to some extent, but more deserving of, you know, appreciation. But still, they're dogs, you know? And, and, and I admit, you know, I have a dog-like quality. I, I'm sure, being a guy. Uh, but they don't interest me. And I could write about uh, this character, Vanessa Kutch, is so a part of the thing. I can't even think of the character's name without thinking of Reese. So I just call her Reese. But, you know, I wrote this character, and it was fun. And so that's really, I, if it had been about a guy, I don't think I could have finished it. It's just like, oh God, like I care. Um, it, somebody made the decision to call it Freeway too before we, uh, before we, um, uh, Trick Baby. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't Freeway at all. It, it was, somebody named it that afterwards. And I, I don't know if they'll want to put that on the, DVD, you know, but um, yeah, I had no intention of doing a Freeway 2. It's, although it is connected in one way in that they're both fairy tales grim, you know. I was, at the time I was really into drawing characters and I have to have a plot and just why not take a plot, you know, steal one. So with, uh, with uh, Freeway I had Little Red Riding Hood and this one I had uh, Hansel and Gretel. And I could have been doing these, you know, because my input wasn't plot. My input was uh, characters. And um, I just, the plot is something to hang them on. I didn't set out to do any comedy. And when I realized that a lot of the stuff I was doing was funny, I just decided to let it be funny without, without trying to control the level of being funny um, at all. And, uh, you know, because uh, then it would be, something completely different. I mean, I, I let them, I let it be what it was. And, and, you know, stuff, stuff comes out funny. I mean, when you have uh, these absolutely berserk characters and these like berserk situations, um, and you have somebody like, you know, Reese or Natasha, or, you know, seriously high IQ people, um, who both of them are incredibly funny much funnier than I am. Um, and I'm talking about in person. I mean, God. So, uh, 
I didn't feel qualified to boss them around on certain levels and one of them was how they were you know portraying their characters and, and uh, the characters that they'd created um, they just it, it, it's just organic it just came out that way and I could have made it god if I made it if I consciously made an effort to keep down humor, I think it would have been like a Hallmark, uh, you know, X-rated, R-rated Hallmark channel, you know, the crying channel. Natasha, I was, I loved her just because Paul Rubens loved her, you know, right there. I mean, that's, that's as the greatest recommendation, you know, for a kid. Um, I, I happen to think Paul Rubens is a genius. I really do. And, uh, he certainly had the best kids show ever, that ever existed, by a hundred times. Anyway, so, yeah, so I went to take a look at her, and I had met her on a, another film that I wrote. Uh, God, what film was that? That was Modern Vampires by uh, Rick Elfman. I wrote that script, and um, so I, I knew her. I got to meet her, and I loved her. Natasha chose him. Yeah, I didn't know anything about him, never seen him before. She just said, he's really good. I just, I trusted Natasha. And I mean, that role, I mean, God, um, who did I go out for? God, I went out for some crazy people. Uh, the woman in Alien, what's her name? You know. Oh, so yeah, I sent it to her and I sent it to Ellen Burstyn. And, uh, Oh God, to play men, you know, to play transsexual men, and and uh, they uh, did not want anything to do with that role. Um, but I tried, and um, uh, Natasha said uh, Vincent Gallo, and uh, then of course I checked everything out. I, I looked at his films and all that, and I thought, he'd, you know, if he says he can do it, he can do it. You know, when a great actor says they can do something, you have to trust them. And if they say they can't, you better trust them too. You know, you don't offer them a ton of money and say, do this. No, I won't do be any good. If they say they won't be any good in it, they won't. But uh, no, Vincent's great. And uh, I'm glad to have him. He was a lot of fun to work with too. Very serious man. Um, the most serious guy I've ever worked with. Um, up until then, uh, you know, it was kind of a wild party with everybody I had worked with. I'm so not the person I was when I wrote that thing, so, you know, it's, it's almost like commentary on someone else's uh, work. Uh, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like another incarnation, you know? It's, it's like looking at someone else's work. It, it really doesn't uh, connect with, you know, how I see myself now, so it's 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 like looking at a past life they're all political all these films are politics and uh, underdogs and overdogs there's you know you're one or the other in this world it's, I guess it's who we are as a species we had a almost a student crew in Canada um, it just wasn't uh, you know, there were always problems. We only, it was a really difficult crew to work with. Um, I'm sure they're better now, I mean, but there were a lot of people that were like interns and, and just stepping in and, and it was, I guess, for the budget. And then when we got to Mexico, um, Tijuana, we had a crew that normally works commercials and that was a crap crew. That was a great crew. I killed my mother. I killed my mother. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. It is terrible. Um, credit, getting credit and, and financing a film through, you know, credit is near impossible. See, the, easier to make a $15 million movie than it is to make a $3 million movie or $4 million. Um, you just can't... Uh, 
you can't, things have changed, particularly since uh, the the crash in 2007. And just credit dried up, and um, I don't know what to do except self fund. Um, so I think I'll go that route at some point, unless. Uh, but independent or studio, I don't know. I've never made a studio film. I've never even had a job with a studio. I've never, never been involved in that. Um, so my agent sent me over there and I dropped off a couple of scripts and um, met them at one of their places in Venice. And they liked the scripts a lot. And so we just started you know, talking and they, they optioned it and we, went out and tried to get it made. Um, not too many people wanted to work with me, you know, new director, you have to, I have to be, you know, sold to them and that wasn't too easy. Um, but Oliver changed that. Um, when did he get involved? I guess a few months afterwards. Um, and uh, that just made all the difference in the world. Suddenly people would talk to you. And, you know, and they hadn't done much stuff by then. Um, they'd done some, but not a lot, and uh, they were as, you know, not as new at it as I, but, Still yeah. So, um, Oliver was a great help to us, and the film was well received, so. It's uh, uh, based, uh, it's composite of two characters, um, one a kid from San Diego and another a kid in uh, Texas, uh, and, uh, well, one's Mexican and out by Juarez, and and um, the other is Mexican American, and he got involved in the cartels without realizing it. I mean, I'm not saying he's innocent; he ain't. Um, but uh, he was involved with, you know, odd jobs for criminal people. The cartels have a lot of businesses, bars, restaurants, uh, extortion, um, kidnapping. Kidnapping was big. So he got a job and uh, he gradually turned into a hitman. And he's, now he's 14 years old and he's like killing people and putting it on YouTube. Um, and so I had wanted to do a story about child soldiers from a book, um, but nobody wanted to make it. It was so dark. I mean, the book was like terrifying. And I just was thinking, how can I do this? What can I do? I want to do child so soldiers. It's kind of universal, whether it's in Cambodia or here or there, wherever. And uh, so I write about uh, the children that work for them, um, not as drug smugglers, but as killers. And, you know, in Mexico, it's advantageous to be very young because under no circumstances will they put somebody under 18 in prison for any length of time. I mean, they'll keep them for a year if they need mental health care. They're much more advanced than we are in that respect. So they kept this kid in jail for about two years and uh, made uh, psychotherapy available to him, you know, heavy therapy, PTSD stuff. I mean, he killed like 100 people. And then they brought him to the border and gave him to his mom and dad and sisters. And uh, he's living in San Diego now, but he's a, he's a stone killer. And his job was uh, training other kids. So I, it's about children making that transformation from just being kids to becoming murderers uh, near to atrocities and that sort of thing. It's kind of like our gang or little rascals or something, but with that. And they're, you know, dealing with all the teenage stuff, you know, love, romance, uh, lessons learned on their way to adulthood, but, it, but they're also serial beheaders. And that's the book. And I mean, I embellish the hell out of it and I give it a plot as opposed to just learning how to do all these terrible things. And, and um, I'm hopeful to make it into a film or preferably a series because it's a pretty long book. I mean, it's a 300 page book and I, I don't know how to get it down to, uh, you know, a 110 page script. So uh, it would be better if it's a series. We accidentally took uh, 700 hits of acid together with another guy. And it, it, it's on tape and uh, we were literally like 
out of it within two minutes. And within three minutes, we were all blind. We couldn't <coughs> see any longer. And to say it was an alarming experience is like, I mean, how do you describe something like that? It, it was just terrifying. And, and uh, I guess you, uh, I mean, we were like 19 years old and you, you take that much and like you, your body can't uh, absorb the, so you just pee it out. So we took the maximum amount you can take. And uh, uh, wow, we were roommates. This he's a very disturbing fellow. He was uh, cranky. He was uh, garrulous. Uh, he was opinionated. He wouldn't hesitate to tell somebody to go fuck themselves. He, he uh, you know, he would snap at you. Um, <laughs> I have an interesting memory of Hervé. Uh, he had a girlfriend. Um, uh, she was she was not a little person and I opened the door and this woman falls into my arms I have no idea who she is it's one o'clock at night and um, who are you <laughs> she said I'm whoever she is whatever her name was a long time ago and I said I don't know you you know <laughs> but you know how can I help you she said I'm Hervé's girlfriend and I bring her into the house, into the light, and uh, he had beaten her with a curtain rod. And he, she was like her arms, you know, she had bare arms, and she just had welts all over her. And Hervé had beat the shit out of her. So I let her stay over, and uh, I hadn't seen Hervé in months. And, but she knew where I lived and, you know, came in and, and uh, God, what an experience. Uh, I don't know why I thought of that. I had some, I had some strange experiences with Hervé. Hervé shot himself in the hand once. So he gave me this pistol, this big cowboy gun, huge. First gun I ever had. And he said, take this, fuck this thing, you know, because it was bigger than his arm, you know. It was like a rifle in his hands. And, and uh, so he gives me this gun, and then it got stolen by a guy who committed a double murder. So just broke into my house and <laughs> did this. So. So everything, he was very disturbing, he was very violent. He was, you know, he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't the guy portrayed on Fantasy Island. And I don't think that anybody's heard this about Hervé. He, he, uh, he, was, a, he was a tough hombre. And he was Susan Terrell's boyfriend. Yeah, we were great friends. I loved her, I loved her. Um, I brought her into uh, Forbidden Zone. That's how she got into forbidden zone and um, that's how uh, boy you have all my uh, my best uh, airway memories <laughs>